Hi, I'm Dr. Jose Hoglar uh, from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. I'm the chair of the 2023 guideline on the diagnosis and management of atrial fibrillation. The guideline is a document that uh, provides advice on the best way to diagnose and manage patients with atrial fibrillation all the way through uh, prevention diagnosis to intervention. Let me uh, introduce you to the vice chair, Mina. Thank you, Jose. I'm Mina Chung. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist at the Cleveland Clinic. We're going to uh, introduce a guideline by covering some of the top take-home messages of this document. It's a huge document, covers every aspect of AFib management. The guidelines is a document that uh, advises the clinical community on how to practice, uh, depending on the guideline, the diverse, uh, diverse medical conditions that we see every day as physicians, especially as cardiologists. The last guideline uh, was um, uh, published in 2014. There was an update in 2019 as well. But you can see that um, it's been a while and there have been a lot of new technology, new findings, new research, new ways of doing things. So it was deemed essential that we came out with an updated version of the guideline in view of all these new changes. Yeah, one of the the major things that you'll see is that um, we have a nice table that talks about stages of atrial fibrillation. So, you know, we've been very used to talking about just paroxysmal versus persistent versus longstanding persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation. But we wanted to also recognize that there may be uh, situ uh, risk factors and conditions that may predispose people to atrial fibrillation and that there may be uh, therapies that can be instituted, like lifestyle changes that could be instituted to perhaps prevent atrial fibrillation. So that pre-phase became uh, important. And then we had different stages of atrial fibrillation and recognizing that people can change in, in between paroxysmal to persistent to uh, being ablated and having no recurrence or having recurrence and then longstanding persistent. What we wanted to emphasize here is that atrial fibrillation is a complex disease and we need to approach the patient in a more holistic way. Instead of just a pure rhythm abnormality, we need to see this as a complex disease that has to be addressed in a multidisciplinary way from prevention, screening, intervention, and long-term management. This is a, a, a change in emphasis as well on focusing on progression, it allows us to focus on progression and burden uh, and you know, recognizing it's not all cut and dry you know, between uh, what we've seen in terms of just characterizing paroxysmal and persistent. We are emphasizing the complexity of these disease is important also that we give recommendations to the medical community on how to address uh, these complexities, especially I'm um, very proud of having included a section that is, provides very robust recommendation and we have provided very precise recommendation on what are those lifestyle interventions that we have to recommend or we should recommend to our patients. Right, you know, it's because some of the some of these lifestyle uh, recommendations have higher or lower level of evidence, and so you know, I think you have to be really congratulated in in terms of steering us toward trying to be more precise and uh, to try to really help practitioners uh, with with making very discreet recommendations and 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 um, practical recommendations. The other thing I like a lot, uh, of course I'm biased, I get that, but I like the fact that we are expanding the ability to have conversations with our patients when it comes to advising them on interventions to mitigate the risk of stroke. Atrial fibrillation is a condition that uh, causes strokes, puts a patient at risk for having strokes, and interventions exist. We use scores, but we thought that it was essential to enhance our ability 
to have conversations, share decision making with our patients. Any comments on that, Nina? Yeah. So, um, so traditionally, uh, over the more recent years, we've all used Chad's two VAS scores, but uh, the writing committee very rightfully recognized that that a lot of the risk scores have their own limitations. And um, so we tried to go beyond just CHAS 2 BASC. Yeah. We want to. So CHAS VASC is probably the most helpful score as far as we go, but there will be instances in, in which the patient needs additional information, perhaps, or instances in which there are other risk factors present that are not addressed by that score. So we are expanding the ability of clinicians to communicate. That's right. And uh, using shared decision making and you know, uh, uh, making a, a, a higher emphasis on the annual percent risk of stroke. Um, so you know, there are a lot of black and white uh, cases in terms of chest tube vasc, you know, over chest tube vasc of, of two in men and three in women, um, where there's not a lot of controversy over needing anticoagulation. But it's in some of the intermediate groups that it's some of our patients really would appreciate a little deeper discussion. And I think that's what uh, the guideline provides as well. Another uh, element of this guideline that I like a lot um, is the fact that we have signs to support early intervention in atrial fibrillation. Historically, uh, many patients have atrial fibrillation for many, many years before aggressive interventions took place. And we're trying to promote the concept of early intervention. There have been very good studies, randomized studies, supporting that uh, pre for the prevention of progression of disease, but also of cardiovascular events. What do you think, Mina? Yeah, this is a very exciting area. You know, early rhythm control has been a very hot topic in atrial fibrillation. And, uh, you know, historically, we have seen uh, n some practitioners really kind of managing with rate control only. Um, and now we have, and part of that really stems back to the AFFIRM trial that was done, you know, decades ago where it was rate versus rhythm control. And in that era, uh, there, it was antirhythmic drugs versus rate control. And, you know, antirhythmic drugs really didn't perform as well, maintain sinus rhythm as well. But a lot of of physicians out there, you know, got this message to not be as aggressive. Well, that has really changed. The paradigm have ch has changed. And we know that um, now with several randomized studies, that early rhythm control, whether it, it be with antrimic drugs or cardioversion or ablation, um, may be very much more effective. Uh, and that, that um, a, a, a big part of Managing atrial fibrillation is preventing progression, preventing the structural changes that can happen, the heart failure that can happen uh, later on. So with that in mind, we, if we are promoting early intervention, also we are upgrading the recommendation for catheter ablation, especially in populations who are most likely to benefit. Um, we like to be more aggressive, like I said. Uh, there's very good data supporting that early intervention is better. Uh, catheter ablation now uh, is upgraded compared to prior guidelines. Like Mina said, I don't believe that medications are that effective based on the evidence. Uh, so catheter ablation um, becomes a more important intervention. You agree right. with that? Yeah, there's still a role for medications, but um, I think you'll see from this a, a lot more um, guidance in terms of early catheter ablation and some of those populations like that you mentioned, including you know heart failure. Yeah. So so we also um, have an, a specific chapter devoted to the population with heart failure, which is a very critical population because it's especially population that is especially prone to having adverse events, hospitalizations for heart failure, or a higher incidence of admission, stroke, mortality, even. So we have a whole chapter dedicated to that population. We have evidence to support a variety of interventions, early catheter ablation, 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 things like that. So what do you think about focusing on that population? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad glad we did that. There's a lot of 
as you as you say, we have a lot of randomized trials in that uh, in that population. We have Castle AF. You know, there's there there Cabana, which uh, showed uh, some benefit in uh, significant benefit in patients with heart failure. So um, there's pretty strong uh, pretty strong evidence base for it. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think uh, uh, that upgrade. Maybe you want to talk about uh, specifics of of the upgrade. So, so now we are uh, recommending catheter ablation on populations who are most likely to benefit, like the paroxysmal patient with fewer comorbidity, to a class one recommendation. You don't have to go through a month or weeks or years of trying medi medications, pharmacological treatment first. The fact is many patients might need both. That's a fact of life, but what we're trying to recommend is uh, to be more aggressive uh, to prevent, like I said, disease progression, but also the fact is that this guideline is a document that is created based on the evidence. We create this, the writing committee meets, looks at the evidence together, and we decide what is the best evidence. And that's the way we write recommendations. The fact is ablation seems to, to be superior to medications when it comes to um, AFib recurrence, isn't it? Right. And, you know, the re level of recommendation is, is also based on um, risk versus benefit. And I think catheter ablation has become safer over the years. So I think, um, you know, that, that came into play as well. That's right. And medications, not only they're not as effective, but also they have side effects too. So we have to acknowledge that. Um, we have other very interesting areas that have not been covered in prior guidelines. For example, we have a chapter and we're going to provide very good recommendations, pres prescriptive recommendations on how to manage patients who have uh, atrial fibrillation diagnosed by devices, as opposed to clinical AFib, where you go to the doctor with atrial fibrillation, this is device-detected AFib. The other thing i like the community to know that we want it to be a one-stop resource for addressing all your patients' needs with atrial fibrillation. This document, I hope, does that, and I think it does. There's tons of other sections that we didn't cover today. For example, how to manage your patient with liver disease on anticoagulation, how to manage your patient who is on anticoagulation but is going to have surgery of some sort, for example. We talk about pregnant patients. We talk about the athletes. We talk about kidney disease. We, we, yeah. We talk about kidney disease. Right, and anticoagulation. So many of these difficult topics. Uh, left atrial appendage occlusion. Uh, well. That's a good point. We absolutely also upgrading the recommendation on left atrial appendage occlusion devices. Um, there is newer data. Uh, that's another uh, technology that has gotten safer over the years. So in that sense, uh, we learn more. In that sense, we also upgrade in recommendation on, on that area. We have also surgical aid, ablation, surgical recommendations for management of patients who have atrial fibrillation after heart surgery, but also atrial fibrillation that happens, um, that is diagnosed after non-cardiac surgery, uh, for example. Right. Yeah, those are all very new recommendations. And, uh, you know, I, uh, as you say, there's a, this, this guideline is very packed. And there will be tools to help you, um, to help the community use, use uh uh, the guidelines, including apps and other uh, derivatives from it. So hopefully uh, moving forward, um, the Joint Committee on Clinical Practice Guidelines have developed um, a change in the way we update guidelines. So uh, the maintenance project is called, it's going to be um, a vision, executing a vision of updating the guidelines in a more frequent basis and a more ongoing basis. So hopefully we'll have an opportunity to revise the guidelines, see how it's received, see what comments we get, see what is the new data, what is the new science, and update this document in a, on an ongoing basis. So, so the co medical community will have updates as needed as opposed to having to wait 10 years, like I said. So 
Mina, thank you so much you. for all your hard work and being part of the writing committee. It's been a tremendous experience. And your leadership has been fantastic through this. So thank, thank you so you. much. It's been a privilege to serve. Thank you so much. And I sincerely hope that the medical community uh, enjoys and uses this guideline, find it useful, and that hopefully it will continue to evolve and continue to improve. And like I said, the maintenance project will help us make changes in a more frequent basis. So thank you so much. And please take a look at this guideline. And I sincerely hope you all enjoy it.